My favorite Lenten book study, and I know it's Advent, but my favorite Lenten book study, was one we did on the short stories of Flannery O'Connor. I don't know if you've ever read Flannery O'Connor, Southern, Catholic, Gothic writer who wrote these stories that just, they, they, there's a kind of grotesque about them if you've never read them. And it can be a little surprising. So when we were doing this study, no one had really read Flannery O'Connor. So they got the book and they read the first story and they showed up on Sundays at the two different locations. And, and we're like, wait a minute, do you know what happens in this story? D d so people, uh, someone dies? And do you know the kind of words that she uses? Mm -hmm. We did. And so uh, my partner and I had to cajole people to show up to kind of the first session, to trust us enough that, that something was happening. And I think it was the best study because it transformed us. Because the shock value of the stories really spoke to your soul. And that was O'Connor's point. She believed people had fallen asleep to what God was doing and how they were supposed to be in the world, and her stories were designed to wake them up. And so if you've not read them, they feature startling things, like grandmothers being pulled off the road and shot in the woods, or in one of her novels, a man runs around in a gorilla suit, or in the most you know, famous, someone throws, a young girl throws a book across a doctor's office at one of the older women. And all her characters eventually kind of wake up. And I wonder if that's not slightly what Jesus is up to in this text today and in the kind of two chapters that follow it. There are all these stories that are designed to wake people up. So he starts with Noah. Not a children's story, I just want to say. Right? I don't know. It's one of those things I find odd. But anyway... Noah's told to build an ark, and he faithfully does it, but everyone thinks he's lost his mind because it's the Middle East, and it's not a flood until there is. And then in a macabre kind of turn, only Noah's family and like a smattering of animals make it onto the ark, and everybody's going about their business until the rains get a little more and a little more, and then they aren't. It's shocking. It's as shocking as if you're grinding wheat next to someone and the next moment they've disappeared. It's as surprising as the thief that comes into your house in the middle of the night and robs you. And if you'd known, you would have put your window down and stopped getting the breeze and locked it. But you didn't know. And there's a series of other stories Jesus tells right after these about drunken servants who are surprised when their master returns about women who are invited to weddings, and some of them don't bring the oil for their lamps, so no party for you. There's sheep and goats because people weren't paying attention to the suffering in their midst. And all of these stories have a kind of shock value to them, designed to wake people up. And it might be that Jesus is talking about the coming of the Son of Man, as in Jesus has come. And it's a startling thing. And in Matthew, that's who we're hanging out with for the next, you know, liturgical year. Um, bye, Luke. Hi, Matthew. Not my favorite. Okay, anyway. So, for the rest of this is towards the end of Matthew. And Jesus is about to be crucified, which is an unexpected event that is going to take people by surprise. And so is the resurrection. And maybe that's why Jesus is telling or maybe it's about the fall of Jerusalem, which is going to come like a thief in the night also, because that happens, he's talking about that before these passages. Maybe he's talking about someday when the Son of Man really does return, it'll be a surprise to everyone. And maybe he's also just talking about the way God comes into the mundaneness of our lives is also pretty surprising. And maybe you've had that experience. It's not exactly clear. It's slightly opaque, which is why it's important to kind of consider all of them together as a bit of a unit talking about wakefulness. This passage today about one being taken and one being left, I feel like it's malpractice on my part if I don't mention that this is not the basis particularly for building your theology of the end of times. That, that, that exists in our world, known as the rapture, 
and came about by American theologians doing their best in the 60s to make something of it, but it says more about American anxiety of the 1960s than what's scripturally true. So I would just invite you to set that aside about this passage and engage it from the sense of Jesus' invitation to wake up to the fact that God is always coming among us unexpectedly. Babies in mangers, crucifixions, resurrections, and in all the ways of our own lives. And wakefulness, it's one of these themes of Advent. It comes back year after year after year. It's one of these themes that recurs in all of the great spiritual masters. Because there's this tendency in humanity to be lulled to sleep by, like, maybe how busy we are, or just by the fact that we're human and our attention spans really aren't that great and they're worse than they ever were, right? And it's hard to pay attention. And it requires a kind of listening to ourselves that sometimes actually we put that to sleep. Because if we really listen to the deepest place in our souls, Maybe we're a little worried that what we're doing isn't jiving with what our soul is speaking to us, but it's easier to just kind of anesthetize that. And the invitation of Advent is to be aware, to be awake. But I also think we say that a lot. I sort of feel like I say it a lot, actually, from this exact position in this exact space. Maybe you feel like that, too. And so, actually, there's a sense that being awake, because it happens so often in scripture and so often in spirituality, we fall asleep to just the idea of that, <laughs> right? It's like a little meta, but it's like, okay, Advent's here. Advent, purple, check. Candle, check. Ah, yes, texts about staying awake. I've heard those, check. Moving on to the next theme, apocalyptic disaster, check. We've got that theme. But, there's something deeply interesting about the invitation to stay awake, and it's not the same every year. We can enter these seasons as Episcopalians with kind of an old hat sense about them, that we do know what Advent's about, that it can be the same. But I would submit to you that it's not the same. It's a helpful repetition. And I don't think sameness and repetition have to be the same. Let me give you an illustration that I think will be helpful if you'll just hang with me for a minute. One of the ancient spiritual practices that comes to us is of the labyrinth. Perhaps you've seen these. They're circular. There's usually kind of four quadrants in the circle lobes. And the invitation is to walk it, prayerfully. It's not unlike a maze, but that kind of puts the wrong connotation on it. Because you're not, you will find your way to the center of it. It's not a mystery but you will walk great distances around. And you will think you've walked very far in say like the upper quadrant. And then you'll come back down to the bottom and you'll literally feel like you're going to exit back out where you came in, except you're just maybe one step over. And you realize, oh, that's where I came in. I'm, I'm just right here. But it feels like the same space, but it's not. You've walked actually a really great distance. You've come a really long, way. And you might be back in a similar place, but it's not the same. See, labyrinths are about a repetition that teaches us about ourselves and about who God is. And I often think that the invitation from the masters is to think of our lives that way. Our spiritual lives are like a labyrinth. We enter them cognizant of God, and we begin to walk a pretty good distance, and God is working on us with something. And we think we've come a great way, we're really different. We've worked on these things, we've matured, we've aged, and then we repeat that same mistake. We suddenly pick task over relationship, or we're moving too fast again. Literally, maybe, you almost run someone down because you're in such a big hurry. Or figuratively, because it's just better to move that pace. And you think, I've made the same mistake again. I'm just where I started, except you're not. You've walked a great distance. You've learned a great many things. And maybe you're back somewhere similar, but it's different in quality or quantity. And I think the seasons of the calendar find us in our labyrinths. And that's the gift of this tradition, 
that as we walk our own lives, we walk through these seasons, and they find us in different parts of our labyrinth, and we're not the same. It may feel the same. I've got the same purple vestment that mostly fits, and we've got the same candles, and, but it's, it's a repetition, and we're different. We're repeating a season, but we come to a change. We've walked a year of our lives. For some of us, that will have mean our jobs changed, for good or for ill. Maybe we met someone and we're delighted. Maybe we lost someone and we're grieved. Maybe we moved. Maybe we've just had a hard time. Maybe we've had a great time. And we enter this season and we're just one step over from where we were last year, but it's not the same and we're not the same. And so I wonder how that kind of repetition is actually helpful as we move through our lives seeing our same foibles from a different perspective, seeing who God is from a different place in the story and in the narrative. And so, rather than it's the same, maybe it's a helpful repetition. And we could ask ourselves, how will I hear my soul this season? When this past year have I fallen asleep? What did that teach me about myself? Where am I finding God right now? Where would I be awake to God right now in this season? What threatens to feel like the same, but if I look back at last year, is actually different? Who am I now? What is the longing God has placed in me in this time and in this place? Wakefulness isn't an invitation to be terrified of the second coming of Christ. It's an invitation to live our fullest life, to pay deep attention to the movement of God in us and around us. Because God is always coming among us in surprising ways, in the most mundane of moments, in the everydayness of our lives. God is there. And that's the invitation of this Advent, to walk into a repeated season that's not the same, a repeated process of our lives, but we're not the same. May God give us eyes to see how we're different and ears to hear how our soul is speaking. And may we walk this journey of Advent different. Lord, may you wake us up.